Her work focuses on the still life qualities of color, light, texture, and composition. She uses her sharp skills of observation and dry sense of humor to create images far beyond the traditional. They give us a fresh take on everyday objects and scenes. On this edition of Art Now, we'll look at the work of Judy Jones. Hi, welcome to Art Now, a program where we talk to artists whose work is part of our community. I'm Pat Salmon, and I'll be your host. Our guest today is the painter Judy Jones. Judy's academic career began with a bachelor's degree in English, followed by bachelor's and master's degrees in art history. When she moved to Champaign-Urbana, she continued her graduate work in art history, then received a master's in library and information science. Judy worked as an events coordinator and publications editor at the University of Illinois, then retired in 2000 and began taking art classes at Parkland College. Judy's art has been shown in many area venues, including Parkland College, the Illini Union, Heartland Gallery, the Art Co-op, the Cinema Gallery, and the Tarbell Arts Center. It also has been included, included in national exhibitions by the Transparent Watercolor Society of America and Watercolor USA. She has won a number of awards, including purchase awards from Parkland College and the Tarbell Arts Center, and several Best of Show awards in the Paris, Illinois Paint Illinois exhibitions. Judy also is a member of Artisans Plus 10, a group of women artists in Champaign-Urbana. Judy, thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Sure. Uh, let's start out by having you tell us a bit about how you first got interested in art. Um, it's kind of hard to say when I first <laughs> did I think I've always been interested in art um, in some capacity. Um, I've always been a person who enjoys doing things with my hands as opposed to thinking. <laughs> um, and I, much of that stuff that I made early on probably could not be considered art exactly. Mm -hmm. But um, it was related to my later interest in painting, I believe. Um, I got interested in painting actually after I switched my major um, from English to art history and um, went into graduate study in art history. I thought that I should um, know a little bit about what artists were going through when mm -hmm. they were making their work. So I thought it would be a good idea for me to take some courses, some practical courses in drawing and painting and, and so on. So that's when I actually started um, doing practical arts. Yeah. Um, I took several courses at the University of Wisconsin in drawing and painting, and um, I uh, continued to do that um, when I had time, raising two children and holding a full-time job. OK. Uh, in your artist statement, you mentioned that after you retired and began start studying at Parkland, uh, your one goal was to render the world realistically. Uh, can you say more about that? Well, when I was taking these courses that I just mentioned, I was always very dissatisfied with how realistic, quote unquote, I was making things. And um, I realize now that that's not a particularly worthy goal, <laughs> that there's plenty of wonderful art that's not realistic. But at that time, I thought that that was the way I wanted to go and that that was the important thing to do. And um, so when I went to Parkland, that's um, what my main goal was when I started out. Mm -hmm. It didn't always stay my main goal. Sure. Okay, you've said that you really see yourself as a still life painter, even though you don't paint traditional kinds of still life subjects. Uh, let's look at some of your work now and see what kinds of subjects you are attracted to and what about them makes you consider them still lifes. So this first one is called Brown Study. Um, this is a very large painting. It's um, as large as the painting that's behind us, if people wow. can see that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's obviously just a very simple subject matter. Um, it's probably a piece of brown paper that I got out of a packing box. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I was just attracted to the folds and the wrinkles and the creases and, and so forth. And I pinned it up on the wall. 
And um, actually, I don't know if you would consider it a still life as much as you would consider it related to um, drapery studies, oh, okay. which is what art students of a former time had to do to become artists. I don't know if art schools still require that, but mm -hmm. um, artists in the past had to do drapery studies. And I see this as being related to that only on a much uh, more mundane level in the sense that it's brown paper. <laughs> in fact, my f some of my friends said, what in the world are you doing spending money and time painting this subject? Who's going to put that up on their wall? <laughs> but actually, I mean, it, it's almost alive. I mean, I, I really like the amount of detail and just... Well, it's very it, textural. And yes. I was very relieved when I showed this at an exhibition and somebody came up to me and said, I understand what that's all about. That's about texture. And mm -hmm. I said, yay, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, this next one is titled Found. Yes. Um, I literally found this when I was taking a walk with my dog. Um, when I take her for walks, I pick up things that I find along the way. This happened to be <laughs> an unusually heavy and unwieldy object and very sharp on the ends. Um, I think it's probably a um, bumper off of a car. Oh. I'm not sure, but it was very heavy to carry home. Um, but I thought it was very beautiful. Um, it's rusted, and the rust color is quite lovely. Um, it also could be hanging on the wall, but it was just too heavy to do that. Um, so I think it really is a still life object, um, although one of some difference from, you know, a vase of flowers or a right. bowl of fruit. Right. Okay. Uh, the next three images we're going to look at uh, seem to anthropomorphize sticks. How did you come up with that idea? Well, again, as I was walking, um, I picked up sticks, <laughs> among other things. And unfortunately, I don't know what kind of sticks these are, but I was very attracted to them. I will show because of these very knobby ends that they have, I thought that these were very sculptural and would be very interesting to draw or paint. Mm -hmm. And um, they, as I brought them home and looked at them, they began to look like monsters or creatures of some sort to mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, these things have to be contained. These can't be allowed to roam around free. Mm -hmm. And so I um, put them in various postures where they're they're safely um, under wraps, so to speak, although actually, you know, if it, they were real, they could easily get out of what they're in. Right. This one is wrapped up in an old painting cloth of mine, and um, which is nailed down to a piece of styrofoam. And <laughs> this poor stick is getting the worst of it. Yes, it's, this is called electrocution of a stick. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think things like this are why I have a reputation among some people as being a little weird. <laughs> But I just thought it was funny, and I was very interested in the shadows that the cord yes. made on this, actually. Yes. Um, I was as interested in that as I am in the stick itself. Right. Okay, uh, the next two we're going to look at have some simple elements that focus on color, and I love the titles. This first one is called Strip Tease. Strip Tease, and then this one is Pick, Pick Up, up Strips. strips. Um, right. I've done several of these. Um, Back in the day when you could get a paper shredder that would actually cut paper into strips rather than chop it up mm -hmm. like all the paper shredders seem to do now, right. I took some watercolors that um, I didn't like and I put them through the paper shredder mm -hmm. and I came out with all these nice colorful strips of, of paper. Mm -hmm. And I've used them in several ways. Um, this one I just tacked them up to the wall with push pins and um, one of the things that's um, of interest here besides the color is the fact that um, I'm doing, trying to do what is called by the French trompe l'oeil, which means fool the eye, mm -hmm. and have the um, effect of th these things actually existing mm -hmm. um, on the wall. And if you look at the actual painting rather than the reproduction, um, they do seem to actually be real and mm -hmm. project from the wall. That's um, the case here. Um, and also with this one, um, there are pieces that actually seem to stick up from the, the floor. Mm -hmm. And so those are the two things that I was really interested in here, was the color and this um, fool the eye effect. Right. 
Okay, uh, this last one we're going to look at uh, is part of a show in which artists were asked to create an image based on peach knee high. Yes. Which I thought was funny just to start with. Yes. Um, <laughs> this idea was conceived by one of the staff members in International Galleries, which is a framing sh uh, shop mm -hmm. and a very good one. Mm -hmm. um, Peach knee high, well knee high is something that you drink, it's a soda, as everybody right. probably knows, and peach knee high is a beautiful, beautiful color. The young man that suggested this idea obviously appreciated the color of this, which is um, pretty much the color that's in that wine glass on the left. Mm -hmm. um, it's a gorgeous color, and he invited a number of artists to participate in this exhibition using this color in some way. And there was a great deal of variety in what he got, as you can imagine. I decided to present it humorously mm -hmm. as kind of a theatrical um, layout mm -hmm. with curtains and um, these things reacting in various ways with each other, um, using these mannequin hands that um, I have and do various things with. Um, this, this was a lot of fun, and the painting was purchased by the lady that runs the Urbana Free Library. Ah. So I was very flattered by that. Great. And she obviously had a sense of humor also. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I like that very much. Okay, uh, plants have occasionally been the subjects of your work as well. Uh, we're going to show a few, few examples here. This first one is called <laughs> titled Georgia O'Leaf. Yeah. <laughs> and it's actually over uh, one of Giorgio keeps a re reproduction of one of her paintings. Uh, yes, that's right. I laid leaves down on a poster of Giorgio O'Keeffe's and um, painted them as well as the poster lying underneath. This is the painting that was purchased by the Tarbell Art Center in, in Charleston, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And um, I th <laughs> sometimes suspect that the juror was as entranced by the title as she was <laughs> by, the, by the painting itself. But this was a lot of fun to do, to do all these dried leaves and, um, and also to think of that title for it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I rarely do flowers, uh, which is one of the mainstays of a lot of watercolor painters. I almost right. never do flowers, right. but I do occasionally do something like this. Right. This next one or, is recycled with gourds. Yes, this is the same kind of thing where the background is um, lying flat. Mm -hmm. um, it's br again brown paper mm -hmm. um, which has been taped together, uh, pieces of brown paper taped together and then I laid all these gourds down on top of it and um, I, in this one obviously color is not of as much interest as the light and dark play, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. shadows. I think yeah. the shadows are extremely important here. Yes. Uh, and the movement. Mm -hmm. um, you see a lot of movement in the way these, um, the ends of the gourds relate to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, this next one is tapestry. Yes, this is also unusual for me to do this kind of thing. I originally conceived of this as something for my uh, brother and sister-in-law mm -hmm. because they were building a wine cellar and they needed oh. a painting to um, go with their wine cellar. Mm -hmm. but. This got kind of out of hand, <laughs> and it got way too big for the space that they needed it for. So How large is this? This is big. It's like the one, again, behind us. It's oh, a 30 okay. by 40, okay. or maybe more with the frame. Yeah. It's quite large. It's, right now, it's residing over in the Alumni Center on campus. Okay. Um, it's part of an exhibition over there. Um, this grape arbor is uh, something in the neighborhood, actually. It's something that I walk past frequently, and mm -hmm. I have taken many pictures of it, yeah. um, painted it several times. Okay. Um, this one is um, called My Obligatory um, Lily Pond. Lily pond. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My Obligatory yeah. Lily Pond painting, um, because it seems like all watercolor painters um, feel that they need to paint lily pads. Mm -hmm. And so I decided, okay, I'll paint one. <laughs> <laughs> this was a lily pond that uh, was in the Isle of Wight in mm. England, yeah. um, where I took a trip with Don Lake and some other students um, and uh, took pictures of this lily pond. So that makes it kind of special, I think, that it was part of that trip that we took. And um, this is the only lily pad painting I've ever painted and probably will never paint one again. <laughs> Okay, these next images are a little bit more abstract. Uh, this one is houseplant 
Profligatus, which is a word I made up. It means profligate house plant, and it, <laughs> which doesn't well mean well named. It, it doesn't mean that it's a sinful um, uh, house plant, which I think is what profligate means sometimes. But it's sort of out of control. Mm -hmm. It was something that got extremely large. The dogs were always digging in the dirt, oh, gee. <laughs> so it just got kind of out of control. So I thought I will paint this thing before I throw it away. <laughs> And um, it's actually the painting that's hanging behind us. Right. And if you look in the upper left-hand corner of this painting, um, you will see the next painting, which I um, cropped from this painting because I sort of liked the way that it looked. Mm -hmm. um, I just call this study from nature. Um, I have to say, I, I don't often brag about my paintings or say that I really like them, but I really do like this painting. <laughs> Um, I would like to paint more in this style, this kind of semi-abstract style where you can still tell that it's based on natural forms, mm -hmm. but um, there is an abstract quality to it. Um, and I put a border around it, which I decided I really like to do. I may do that some more. Yeah, I like that too. Mm -hmm. Okay. This, and this one is Pomegranate Murder. Yes, again, again, I like the title. Yes, again, a title which is designed to grab the attention. Right. <laughs> um, you probably know that when you cut into a pomegranate, the juice is very bright red, and mm. um, it looks like blood. I'm sorry, mm. it just does. Yes. <laughs> and I just thought, um, I'm going to paint that and with a, leave the big butcher knife that I use in there. Mm -hmm. And actually that butcher knife appears in some of my other paintings, again, making people think that maybe I'm a little strange. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I love the color in this and um, the shapes of the shadows, which more or less echo the shape of the butcher knife, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on now to uh, some other outdoor scenes that you brought your still life sensibility to. Uh, this first one is called Left to Rust. Um, this is one of a very few, actually, I've painted two landscapes that mm -hmm. are typical landscapes like this mm -hmm. with a horizontal format and a mm -hmm. lot of attention given to the sky mm -hmm. and so forth. I just Strangely, I, I, it amazes me that I don't paint, want to paint landscapes because Don Leake was my teacher. Right. And he, of course, is a consummate landscape painter. Right. But for some reason, I just am not interested. And mm -hmm. to be honest, what was interesting to me in this landscape was that orange <laughs> machine out there in the middle, mm -hmm. and especially those sort of aqua blue windows in it, which mm -hmm. I did overemphasize maybe the color a bit, but I thought it was so pretty that color against the orange of the machine. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of got into the sky and I thought maybe yeah. someday I'll want to do more things like this with skies. Okay. This next one is called Ticky Tacky Houses. Ticky Tacky Houses, yes. That was in a song from the 60s right. like, by the Beatles, I'm not sure. Oh, it wasn't the Beatles, I think it was a folk group. But anyway. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> anyway, Ticky Tacky Houses is how I think of these houses. And, I live in one of these, not one of these houses here but specifically, <laughs> but I, I live near this subdivision which was being built. My daughter actually took the photograph that this painting is based on and I just love the way this big machine totally dominates the landscape. Mm -hmm. And um, I did emphasize the sky and the storminess of the sky and the dark color. And I also emphasized the similarity among all those houses. They weren't really that similar, but they are kind of ticky-tacky. Right. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, this is called One Way uh, Chicago L. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think again, probably I would say there's a still life uh, focus being brought to this because it's a cityscape, although the city is not as important as that big L, <laughs> mm -hmm. that big yellow thing. And that was what interested me about this scene. Um, I took this picture myself in Chicago while waiting for my husband to get the car out of the garage. And um, it, um, it's the yellow color, it's the structure of the L that is um, appealing to me. Um, so I guess you could call this um, having a still life mentality. 
Okay, and then this last one is, is very different. It's called Old Barn. I, again, I could probably call this my obligatory Old Barn painting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's different from most. <laughs> <laughs> it is a subject, again, that watercolor painters like to paint, and almost everybody that does watercolors has at some time or another painted an old barn. Um, I took a lot of pictures of this old barn, which I happened to just see one day as I was driving, I think along Route 29, um, and this was the one that appealed to me most. Um, color is the main thing here. This was a complementary color painting, the mm -hmm. blue and the yellow um, being complementary colors. and. Um, so that was what I was mostly interested in here was the color, but also the light and shade. It plays a very important role in this painting. Right. Okay, and this last one we look at is not an outdoor scene, but it kind of brings together indoors and outdoors. Um, when Jamie Crydenier was teaching watercolor at, at Parkland after Don Lake retired, mm -hmm. she gave us an assignment called Sacred Places or Sacred Spaces. Mm -hmm. and. To me, that implied a church, <laughs> and I don't go to church. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I started thinking about other kinds of spaces that were not necessarily sacred, but very um, sanctuary-like, mm -hmm. protective, and so forth. And this was a scene in my daughter's apartment. She bought these uh, very attractive draperies someplace. And so I thought that would make a nice contrast with the um, seen outside, which is very chilly, painted in um, cool colors, blue and purple and white, uh, against the reds and yellows of the interior. And it, to me, it's a very comforting, warm, safe looking place. Mm -hmm. it's, um, actually, I call, did you mention I called no, this Haven? Haven. Haven. Yes, <laughs> yes. And, and I can feel that. I mean, I mm -hmm. really think you did a good job of getting that feeling across. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, finally, we're going to look at some paintings of figures and animals that you've done from unusual perspectives. All right. This first one is Best Friends. Best Friends. Um, this is my daughter and one of her huskies. Mm -hmm. um, you don't really see my daughter's face at all, mm -hmm. and you don't really see the dog's face clearly. Um, so to me, this is a still life. This is um, objects on the floor. Mm -hmm even though it's, they're you know, of personal meaning to me. Um, when I paint people, you almost never see their faces. Um, dogs, the same way. Um, I was very interested in this, in the light. You can see that the yes. light is coming through Venetian blinds mm -hmm. and creating these stripes of light mm -hmm. on, the gra on the floor. And so that was one of my main interests, and also the color. And then what you call negative space, like the space between the, the figure's arms, between the dog's feet, mm -hmm. and then the relationship of those spaces to each other. Yeah. But I do consider this a still life, rather than a figural painting or a dog portrait. Right. Well, this next one I really liked, dog feet. <laughs> <laughs> I love, uh, I love dog's feet. I love <laughs> especially husky feet because they are very soft and they have hair growing between the little pads mm -hmm. um, to protect them from the snow. And um, they're very soft and I, well, I just love them. And um, again, this is a picture that my daughter took of her husky, one of her huskies. And um, I cropped it more than she cropped it. She did not show the whole dog, but I cropped it even more mm -hmm. just to show mainly the feet and mm -hmm. enough of the nose and so forth to be able to tell what it was. But really, what my interest is here uh, is the drapery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, uh, mm -hmm. I think he's probably lying on a bed, uh, and that's the sheet that's been all wrinkled and uh, pulled up in places, and that was what I was interested in. Um, not a dog portrait. Right. Um, but the drapery, and again, so again, I see this as a kind of a still life. Right. Okay, this next one is called Elemental Triptych. I wish that I remembered why I painted this. <laughs> 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 I don't remember what the original impetus was for it. Um, I think I wanted to paint the dog, and I think I wanted to paint him differently than I had painted dogs before. Mm -hmm. uh, the triptych form, 
It's not original with me, certainly. Um, it goes way back, well, right. to religious art right. first, and then even uh, somebody like James Rosenquist in the uh, early or in the mid 20th century painted a very famous triptych. And um, a lot of people I know paint the triptych form. In fact, including uh, Steve Hudson at Parkland College, had went through a phase of painting triptychs. Um, but it's a neat uh, format, I think. Mm -hmm. And this one, I didn't really plan out. I just simply wanted to paint the dog, and then I wanted to put things with it that somehow looked good. Um, so I chose the stones and some lilies that were past their prime, uh, lily leaves, and put them together. And then I realized that what I had was um, animal, vegetable, and mineral. <laughs> or actually, animal, mineral, and vegetable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that's why I call it elemental triptych, because it refers to you know, the, what some people consider the three basic uh, elements of, of life, or what right. uh, somebody in the old days said right. were the three basic elements. Right. So um, that's the story behind that painting. Okay. And this one is called Trying to Sleep. <laughs> and I think you've captured it very well. <laughs> My daughter, um, who has taken a number of the pictures that I've used, um, sleeps with a pillow on her head because she's very sensitive to noise. Um, and you typically find her with a pillow over her head. So I took a picture of her. And you don't see her. You would never know what my daughter looked like from this <laughs> painting. <laughs> but that was not my intention. I think, again, like in the um, dog feet, the interest here is in the drapery, the big, heavy comforter that is covering her and the pillow, and um, the colors, mm -hmm. and um, the formal elements, rather than it's not a portrait of my daughter, obviously. <laughs> no, at the same time, though, you are getting across the feeling that it's yes. the frustrating feeling of not being able to sleep. Yes, and <laughs> you're too noisy. <laughs> and is that it? That is it. Uh, now, you've obviously been attracted to art throughout your life. Uh, what do you think creating art does for you? Well, it keeps me busy. It keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> um, it's something that I can focus on like I can't focus on anything else. You know, I get started working on a work and I just, it just is very compelling to me. And um, I think that it's something that I'll never lose interest in doing. I know a number of people who are in their 80s mm -hmm. um, who are still extremely creative and um, I admire these people very much, and it gives me hope for the future. Great. You know, they, even, you, well, even if you go sort of blind, I, I figure maybe I'll be able to paint more abstractly. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a way. <laughs> but I think it's something that you can keep on doing for, you know, for your entire life. Um, it's inspiring to me. It's frustrating, but it's a, it's a pleasant frustration. It's a fun frustration. Great. And it's something that, that, for me, it's fun. That's important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thanks again for being with us today, mm -hmm. Judy. And thanks for watching Art Now. Our guest today has been Judy Jones. If you are interested in learning more about her work, contact her at her email address, huskies57 at mac.com. We hope that you enjoyed t today's show, and we also hope it will inspire you to explore the local art scene and to make your own art now.